All right, this is the pre-class video for class number 14, I believe. Um, it's the first class on Hinduism. And I have attached scans of the book, even though I really want you to buy the book because we're violating copyright. Um, I have these scans because I taught this class to women who were in 12 different Southeast Asian countries, Afghanistan, they didn't have access to the book. So please just buy the book um, because it's the law. So anyway, so today the main concepts are creation, the idea of creation. What is creation? And Hindus don't care about the nature of creation. They have multiple creation stories because they really don't care <laughs> about the origin story. What they care about is the nature of the universe, not the origin of the universe. And the notion of karma, right? And our whole goal in life is to create positive karma and to flush out negative karma. Another main issue is that we are a piece of the cosmos deep inside of ourselves. We are connected to the cosmos and the maya, the material part of us, the physical part is an illusion and it keeps getting in the way. And we have to constantly try to stay in touch with the Atman Brahman, the piece of the cosmos that is inside of us. This to me is analogous. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Um, let your light shine. Or the Greeks have the light of the mind, nous. Um, but it's also more, I'd say, environmentally friendly because you have to keep in touch with the natural world also. It's definitely a part of maintaining positive karma. So. Hinduism and Buddhism are, I think, more amenable to environmental concerns, and it's less difficult to attach the religious tradition to changes to sustainability issues right now. But Confucianism was also the great harmony is more amenable to um, sustainability it was the Judeo-Christian tradition during the Enlightenment that used Christianity to justify the, the exploitation of nature for human well-being. And so the West is, has a more difficult lift in trying to make sure Christianity gets linked to sustainability, even though the Sermon on the Mount would never um, lead you to that conclusion. But if you look at the history and the context and all that, it's much more difficult. Anyway, so my first, the first issue is creation. Then we're going to talk about the outline. I'll, I'll run through the outline of the reading. And then we'll talk a little bit about Myers-Briggs personality tests and the difference between the West uh, and their use of personality tests and then the Hindu view of four paths to God. So it kind of reveals things about West, Western culture that might be positive and might be negative. It's just up to you to decide. My job is just to explain to you what these differences are. So the first issue is creation. Um, for you to, to ask yourself, well, what is creation? What does it mean? Um, what does the word mean for one thing? And why do we argue about it? So how much of your faith depends upon the creation stories? There's two creation stories in the Old Testament, actually. <laughs> so I think a lot of self-identified Christians don't know that. Um, in the second one, all it says is male and female, he created them. Voila, it's very egalitarian. That's not the one most of my students know. But 
um, here are here are some examples of the Hindu creation stories taken from the holy books. It's called the Vedas, the Vedas. Um, just to give you an idea that the Hindus wanted you to keep an open mind about creation. So they just envision it differently. In the beginning, the golden embryo evolved. Once born, he was the one Lord of every being. So, you know, the golden embryo sounds kind of like the Big Bang. Um, in the beginning was darkness and, and all this was but manifested water, whatever was that one coming into being hidden by the void was generated by the power of heat. So, okay, so um, in the beginning, the one evolved, became desire, first seed of mind, wise seers searching within their hearts, found the bond between being and non-being. So the idea is that there was a beginning and uh, desire and mind. Mind was the product of a natural evolution. So human beings are naturally evolved and the human mind is naturally evolved. That's more like Aristotle. The mind is the product of evolution. Again, you can think that there's a Judeo-Christian God that created the universe so that eventually the mind would evolve and it would understand the universe and our place in the universe is to understand it, not to destroy it. You can go that way if you want. Um, but the main thing is that that's the Hindu view. In the beginning, nothing at all existed. And, um, and death thought, gee, I wish I had a self. He divided it into three parts. Hunger and death copulated with speech by means of mind. <laughs> All right, whatever. Um, in the beginning was the self alone in the likeness of a man. And now I don't know why it would be a man, but he was afraid and he found no pleasure. He longed for a second. Now, let's just remind you a little of the Adam and Eve story. Um, he was of the size of a man and a woman in close embrace. He split himself in two. Okay, this is similar and different to the Genesis story where um, Eve came out of a rib of Adam. And from there arose husband and wife. She took thought and said to herself, how is it that he copulates with me, although he generated me from his very self? Very well, I will disappear. She became a cow, he a bull. He copulated with her and then cattle were born. And I can read further from this creation story. Um, she became a she-goat, he a he-goat. She became a ewe, he became a ram. He copulated her with her and, and thence were goats and sheep born. So did he bring forth all couples that exist, even down to the ants, he brought forth this whole universe. He knew that he was the whole of creation, for he had brought it all forth. All right, so, so that's, <laughs> that's a very male-centered idea of creation. It's the copulation view, and I thought maybe all of you would like to hear about that, but the men especially would, hey, that, that sounds really good. Um, all right, so that's that's my first point, is that it's problematic. What is creation? And should you just envision it in a lot of different ways to get to the main point, which is how did we emerge and how are we supposed to live? That's the main point. All right, so in Hindu mythology, there are three personifications of the powers of the universe. Brahma is creation, the source from which all the other deities spring, right? And then it also has, as milk changes to curd and water to ice, so is Brahma variously transformed. Well, the Trinity is often described this way. 
is three forms of the same thing. Um, the human soul is a portion of the supreme ruler, as a spark is of the fire. So that notion of the light of the mind is present in, I don't know, lots of ancient wisdom traditions. Then there's the force of preservation. This one's interesting because Vishnu's job is to preserve the earth. And whenever, um, okay, and he comes forth, at, he reincarnates. Whenever the world is going down, he will, he will come to earth in a different form to try and redeem the earth, which redeems society. Okay, he will intervene to punish wrongdoers. And in the Bhagavad Gita, which I'll talk about next time, is sort of one small section of the Hindu Vedas, but probably the most popular one. And in that one, um, Vishnu comes down in the form of Krishna, which is a personification of person. Um, so Buddha was a follower of this tradition, um, but the Hindus say that he was um, a false incarnation of Vishnu. Okay, the Buddhas will say that he was an incarnation of Buddha, of the Vishnu. So they disagree. But my main point is that Buddhism started out, Buddha started out as a Hindu, and then he ended up making a new religion, not necessarily because he wanted to, but because the corruption of the religion was so bad. So Jesus started out a Jew, and he wanted a spiritual revival. And he ended up making a new religion or a new religion was formed after that. Okay, so there is a belief among some Hindus that there will be another reincarnation of Vishnu and that will be at the end, end times. Okay, so this is similar to Christianity's idea of revelation. Um, of course, when you unify reason and faith, you would say, but we, we have to act in a way that constantly creates positive karma or constantly tries to promote human flourishing and sustainability. We don't just turn our backs to those problems and just say, oh, it's the end times. But I'm, I'm sure there's some, uh, some uh, Hindus that do that because it's there, like you can find it in the scripture, but it's definitely not the overall spirit of the religion. And then there's the force of destruction. Um, and that's, that's just the idea that as evolution occurs, some things die out and some things uh, are born, but the overall direction is for more and more complexity, more and more species. And right now, of course, there's a huge um, uh, loss of species as part of our human-made environmental destruction. But at any rate, today, modern humanism, nobody worships Brahma, but they do worship Vishnu or Shiva. And they have these different sects. So here's another Hindu creation story. Um, and there's uh, copies from the book where I read from. Um, let's see, you don't have to read that. It's just, it, I put it in there because while you're reading it, you can sort of liberate your imagination and you can realize how much of my consciousness has been affected by the Genesis story whether I'm aware of it or not. So it's just kind of making you aware of how you've been conditioned into something. And then you want to step back and say, wait a sec, what's another way to look at that? Um, because if you didn't grow up in your particular culture within the United States, it doesn't mean anything to you. The, Adam and Eve's story doesn't mean anything to you, but that has nothing to do with whether you care about virtue or justice or truth. Um, 
So the question is, what does the Big Bang, what on earth does it mean? What does it imply? Was there time or space before that? And then the Hindu view is it really doesn't matter. It's just that the universe went from potentially what it, what it is to actually what it is. It was just an emergence. Um, all right, so you can look at it in different ways. Um, the enlightenment thinkers tend to look at God as the clockmaker who wound up the universe, but he doesn't intervene in human history. Other people will think of God as the cause of the Big Bang, but once it was established, it's self-regulating, doesn't keep interfering because it is perfect already. Why would God change the creation just to fit with your life? Um, it just emerges and it sustains itself. And our job is to understand it. Um, God is the sustainer. God is constantly changing as the universe changes. And what is our relationship to it? And that's something you really do need to think about because you're going to live at a time when environmental problems are going to get worse and worse. And you need to think about what's your philosophy behind that. Then some atheists think that everything is just a big accident and life doesn't have any meaning or purpose, which I definitely disagree with um, because it gets you off the hook again. It, whatever else we may think, we need to think that our purpose is to help each other flourish and to respect the natural world. Any worldview that somehow gets you out of those responsibilities is does not unify reason and faith. And luckily that's Lyon's cornerstone. So I can say I am very much in the spirit of Lyon College when I say that, that I disagree with that. Um, all right. And we will talk about the relation between Hinduism and Buddhism. So just for a thought experiment, for you to think about, well, what is, what do I think creation is? How important is it? Um, am I going to be able, am I going to use that as a wedge between me and other people? Am I going to use it as a weapon for thinking I'm better than somebody else? Um, am I going to use it as a way to break down conversations and to polarize me and my fellow Americans or my fellow human beings? And it's, it's up to you. Um, all right, so here's the outline of the chapter on Hinduism. The idea is that cultural select, cultures select for various aspects of life. And so Confucianism obviously selected for relationships. So Confucius is trying to rebuild civilization and he focuses mostly on there's a breakdown in relationships and he's trying to repair relationships by talking about the good old days the golden age of china this is how people related to each other and they were situations of inequality so as soon as you're born you're born into a set of relationships and you maintain those relationships and you may go from being the older brother, the younger brother to the older brother, and then you change your relationship with your sibling. I mean, there's always growth, but within that, there's always a set of duties. All right. India selected for meditation, inner consciousness, the inner life. And so they make many distinctions about your consciousness. And of course, they have the Hindu, the yoga, they have the chakras, they figure out these different energy points in your body, they work on diet, they, the yoga is exercise, and scientists have, have discovered that it was very well, it's, it's very empirical, right? Um, our modern scientific techniques can just legitimize this ancient wisdom, like they knew 
what they were doing. They knew really how to keep mind, body, and spirit sort of in harmony to maintain positive karma in a person's life. So that's why I think it's definitely worth reading, partly just as a historical document, partly because there are Hindus in the world that we need to get along with, but partly because we need to learn some of the things that they teach. Whereas the, in the West, we chose our relation to the natural world is how we have progressed. We certainly have progressed by exploiting the natural world, but we need to reconsider the foundations of our society and our science is showing us that we need to move towards sustainability. Um, okay, so the overall outline of Hinduism, if you, if you remember with Confucianism, um, we focused on the emphasis on individuality in the West and rationality, if you remember, and then Confucius rejected that and focused on relationships. And so I asked you to rethink, you know, your situation, America's situation, what we can learn. The founding fathers thought we could learn a lot from Confucianism. And now on this chapter, Max Muller has, has indicated that he thinks Hinduism is the best corrective for what's most wanted in order to make our inner life more perfect, um, more truly human life. So he's, he's thinking of in terms of our internal consciousness, we could learn a lot from Hinduism. So uh, the founding fathers, in terms of our relationship issues, we can learn a lot from Confucianism. And Muller says, in relationship to our internal consciousness, we can learn a lot from Hinduism. So the word conversion means to turn around. So there are many versions of turning around. And so Hinduism has a big focus on turning from maya, the appearance, the material world, to the spiritual world, okay? There's also pretty much in almost every class you have at Lion, there is a kind of turning around. Like in science, what you see with your eyeballs is just a lot of stuff and a lot of things happening. And the science turns you around to give you a causal network. Here's the underlying causal relationships. Um, in social science, you can, again, you look at all this stuff going on, and the research tries to look for some kind of pattern, some way to see more deeply what is going on, to ask why is this going on? What's the context? And then in philosophy, of course, it's trying to do this in this huge comprehensive way. But you can ask yourself, have I ever had a conversion experience? And of course, it might be the, the standard Baptist one where somewhere in adolescence, you have, you're baptized because you have a conversion experience. But it could be easily um, some kind of intellectual conversion, could be a philosophically based conversion, it could be science-based. All of a sudden I understood that the biosphere hangs together and it's behind the things that I see. Or all of a sudden I understood physics, or quantum mechanics or something. And now I, I think of the world that way. Um, then the next thing we'll talk about is the link between Western science and psychology and Eastern mysticism, how they can reinforce each other. Then we'll talk about stress. Is this uh, human or is this socially constructed? And if you remember, Esther Sternberg talked about her experience with stress and part of it was this excessive obsession about science without also balancing it out with emotions and the arts and getting back in touch with your body and also religion. Remember her mother was religious and I was asking her, why, why are you so against religion? 
And so then she ended up in Crete, which is this naturalistic based sort of spirituality. And that helped her heal from her stress. So she would say her stress was partly caused by her, her worldview. It was way too focused on science as if science alone can make you healthy or happy or in, you know, in touch with yourself and able to live a complete life. All right, so the next issue is the, the Hindus think there are four paths in life. Okay, so there's, there's four in two senses. So four paths in life and then four paths to God. So those are two different things. What do you really want in life? And so you should ask yourself that and then come to class saying, you know, this is where I'm at right now. Um, pleasure. And the Hindus don't uh, condemn someone who feels, who is on the path of pleasure. So if you see someone who's very impulsive and um, I don't know, I always think of midlife, they're middle-aged men who sometimes um, get divorced and go buy a sports car and sort of drive it around and act like a kid, trying to recover their adolescence or something like that. They might marry a woman who's 20 years younger than them. And instead of condemning them, a Hindu would say they're a young soul. They've, they haven't been through as many incarnations as an old soul has. So you have your chronological age, but you have your psychological age or your spiritual age. So some people just are old souls. Um, and, you know, I've had many students that secretly, like they come and tell me, I actually do believe in reincarnation, or I do think I have an old soul, because this isn't usually socially acceptable in our country to say this, but really, um, it's got its own reasons. People have their own intuitions, they have their own experiences, and you should have an open mind, just entertain that idea. Then there's success, that people work hard and they um, achieve things. And the thing is a person whose uh, soul is at that point can't stop, right? They just constantly have to get richer and richer or more and more powerful. They're obsessed with it. So it's one thing to get established and then to think about the spiritual life or about giving back. But these people who um, you know, are still going to the law office when they're 90 years old because they just can't stop, they're, they're in this you know, one path all the way through life. And sometimes that really hurts their family. They don't have time for family. They don't even have time for grandchildren. They can't step down. So, but you might be on that path right now um, that you want to achieve these goals, professional goals, and that's fine. Um, then there's, yeah, chronological age versus psychological age. Then um, if you're going through the phases in life, in a, in a spiritually appropriate way, at a certain point you step back after you've been successful and you start giving back. There's more to life than just make money and power uh, and pleasure, right? So then is the path of duty. And this is, Bill Gates is a very good example of this because of course he's very successful, but for a long time, he kept obsessing about being number one. Long after he was number one, he was still competing as somebody else might get ahead of me. And finally, his father actually had a, a public interview. Well, we're trying to convince Trey, which is what they call him, that, you know, he's on top. He has to stop obsessing. 
and he got married, he had kids, and he stepped back. And so he went from being the stingiest human being in human history, because for a while there, he was the richest human being, but he still didn't give back. Then he completely changed. And now he runs the Gates Foundation. He has plans to give away a huge chunk of his money. He has interviews saying that rich people really need to be taxed more and they shouldn't be taxed by their income. They should be taxed on their wealth, on capital gains, on their investments. I mean, he's very, very um, activist in the sense of the need to redistribute wealth and also sustainability is a big issue for him. And he set up this billionaire boys club that together they're trying to work on research and development. They've got this very, very holistic view of how to get us to zero carbon emissions and how to even suck carbon out of the air because it's such a terrible problem. But anyway, so Bill Gates went from being the stingiest guy in human history to being perhaps the most generous guy in human history. Uh, but he's still obsessed about his foundation. He's not, he's not a contemplative. <laughs> I don't think he's going to get into Buddhist, me uh, Hindu meditation or yoga anytime soon. Um, but then, um, then there is the fourth path is turning around. This is when after you've given everything and you realize, you know, the world just keeps going. You say, is there anything else in life? than this. And that's when the Hindu, Hinduism comes in. And Hinduism says, yes, there is. There's getting in touch with that Atman inside of you. So far, you've been totally focused on the outside world. But the real spiritual path, true self-knowledge, is to turn inward. And there are four different paths to God. So one of them is reflection or knowledge. And so these people study the sages the, the, and um, do a lot of studying to get in touch. They don't think of God as a person. God is energy. And so they're um, studying how this energy manifests in the world. And then there's the path of love. Most people take the path of love because they live with their heart rather than their head and they personify God. So if you take the path of love, you have to make God into a person because your whole thing is relationships. That's how you find God is through your relationships. And so in, in Hinduism, I think it's really interesting because you have a prayer that says, forgive me for making you into a person. <laughs> And that's not true in the Judeo-Christian Muslim tradition. In that tradition, God is a person, a very specific, is personified and has a very specific plan for history and very specific people who are going to uh, realize his plan. Uh, and it's a man and all this stuff. But um, the Hindus have multiple gods and you see them all over, right? You see images of different gods. And you have uh, elephant God, monkey God, because you're, you're supposed to get over any sort of literal uh, understanding of that personification. You're supposed to know it's just about energy. So whatever symbolic image triggers your relationship to your Atman, that would be the one that you turn to, right? You don't worship the image, but you turn to that one for inspiration or for your path back to the Atman. Um, then there's the path of work. And these are people who definitely, you prove, you prove your relation to God by doing stuff. And activists, in every religious tradition, there are the contemplatives, and the relationship people, and then the activists. So there is a path to the deity, the Atman, through work. But it's a special way of working. 
And so if you have a religious duty to try and change the society, like Gandhi is, is the example, he was on the path of work. He felt called, it was his spiritual calling to rally the, his people to get rid of the British uh, imperialists. But he did it without emotion, without calculating consequences. It's very important for him that people would stay in touch with the Atman. So it was nonviolent civil resistance. Um, and this is Martin Luther King studied Gandhi. So again, this is interfaith. Martin Luther King applied it to his own faith tradition of prophets, but Gandhi was his model. And then there's the path through yoga and extreme introversion and exercises. Then there's the four stages. And if you remember with Confucius, you had different stages in life. Hindus also have different stages. So the student, that would be most similar to the path of knowledge, right? Reflection. You learn about um, the Atman, you learn about the poetry, the history, all the things underneath, right? If you think there is an Atman within us and without us, you need to study, you know, how that manifests. Then there's the householder, then at age 30, um, according to Confucius, right? I put my feet on the ground. This is you're married, you have kids, you're trying to do a career, get not trying to get all this stuff together. Um, but again, you would do it in a way that you're not completely invested in it. You can always um, stay in touch with your Atma. And then retirement is you become more detached. So the goal is, is to become more disengaged with all that frantic stuff that goes on. So by the end of your life, if you've had a successful life, you can, you're a beggar. And the story was that the teacher um, was, came to his, the house of his student with his begging bowl and that that was sort of expected that the teacher has um, disengaged and gotten in touch with what matters, the sacred, the Atman, and now has nothing. But the former student uh, who helped, helped him or her get in touch with the Atman, educated her, now provides sustenance. Um, now, I want you to think about the difference between that and Americans. When Americans retire, what do they picture? You know, I'm gonna do what I always wanted to do, I'm gonna travel, I'm gonna start a new organization. I mean, retired people do a lot of stuff and they tend to get rewarded the more they do because while they were working, they tended to get rewarded for the more they do. So you can think about how we get conditioned into um, we are what we do or we are what we achieve and how Hinduism just has a very different approach to what's most valuable, the ultimate value and meaning in life. Um, and then the other thing that's, that we need to consider, although it's uncomfortable for us and I certainly would advocate uh, because it gets so corrupt so easily, but there are different spiritual gifts, all right? So some people are really visionaries and they, they get ideas. And as they're growing up, these are kids, kids are different and they see the world differently. And it's not just that some are rebellious and some are good good boys and girls. It's just that they experience life differently. And so some will have a vision of a better world. Some will want to be poets. Some will want to be um, educators. Some will want to be um, musicians, um, prophets, right? 
Um, they, they envision the future of the species, like John Stuart Mill said, that's what intellectuals are supposed to do, because they're supposed to lead people forward, uh, take what's best from the past, uh, make sure people are not afraid of change, give them the arguments that, that would convince them. So yeah, change is good, we can do this. Um, so there's many, many different types of visionaries but we need them, society needs them. And they belong in Hinduism, they belong to the Brahmin caste, okay? Then there's the administrators, like natural managers, people who just naturally wanna organize things, get things done. They're very good at getting organized. Um, they're very good at delegating responsibility and they have the most hectic lives and they have the most influence on the society's functioning. And so they do get paid more, but they're supposed to, if you're in a position like that, you're not doing it for the pay or the power. The reason you get the power and the pay is because you're actually doing it in a way that actually benefits everybody else. Then there's the producers. These are people who just want to work 40 hour a week, come home, um, just some people are just introverts. They just wanna be home, but some want to run the Cub Scouts or the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or um, the, they wanna be coaches on kids' teams. They wanna be involved with kids extra, extracurricular activities, or they want to be involved with other volunteer activities. And they, they just want to be able to clock in at work and leave work behind and think about these other things, which is great. Um, I raised three kids and I really appreciated people who that was their thing. And they would coach my kids teams and they would run the Girl Scouts and all that. And I appreciated them a lot because I was one of those seers, you know, I was in my world of my head and I wished I could do these other things, but I really, I definitely couldn't do them at the same time, but I really wasn't very good at any of those other things. I tried, you know, I was the assistant Girl Scout leader or something, and I just didn't have any ideas about it. It was just kind of on my check sheet and uh, I felt bad about it, but it just, nobody can do everything. You have to find out what you can do and do it and do it well. And then there's some people, right? The laborers and the, it's always been a problem that societies need manual labor. And the key is, are there some people who really enjoy that kind of work and they just shouldn't, they should get paid a decent living. They should be provided for. So what starts out as spiritual, right? Spiritual, people are tied to the earth or they're tied, yeah. And they just wanna do like work on a farm or work on mechanics. There was a guy on the grounds crew at Lyon who told me he had an office job before that paid more, but he just couldn't stand it. He just wants to get up in the morning and go over on the grounds crew and do his thing. Um, there might be other people on the grounds crew who feel frustrated because they didn't get enough education. I don't know. My main point is that people have different orientations and the society should make sure to, that everyone is provided for. And um, that's the problem. <laughs> and that was a problem in um, Hinduism was the untouchables. So the laborers who like cleaned the toilets um, were the ones that were untouchable. And in India, this caste system is still a big problem, but Houston Smith always starts out with, it wasn't a bad idea. What happened was, if someone in the Brahmin class had a child who really felt most at home as a laborer or producer, they just wouldn't 
allow for it, right? It's not the family brand. Or somebody is an administrator whose children just don't want that level of responsibility. They can't do it very well and they don't want to do it. So people on the top kept passing on their power and privilege to their children and their grandchildren. And that's where the system becomes dysfunctional. The spiritual under the underlying spirituality of the original idea gets completely corrupted by money and power, which of course happens with just about everything. Um, and that happens in the United States. However, it's just sort of covered up. But it's very important to track who are the richest people in the world and the most powerful in the United States. What are they teaching their children, right? Are their children allowed to be themselves? Or are they passing on the legacy? Are they passing on their empire, or whatever they've, they've created, to children who are corrupt? <laughs> Right? The children, well, either they're unhappy because it isn't what they want, they're incompetent, or they're corrupt. So, a great case of this is Jerry Falwell Jr. I mean, Jerry Falwell. He, I understand his original motive for um, wanting to re, re, ignite a much more conservative kind of Christianity. He said he went to college and his professors told him, I'm going to beat the religion out of you. Well, of course, that would draw a terrible reaction. And it got a whole movement. How many of the people who were behind Jerry Powell had actually gone to college and experienced this extremely polarizing kind of secularism? you know, science versus religion, religion is backward, all that stuff. I mean, we've been through that with humanism. It shouldn't be that way, but it was. So Falwell started Liberty University, started this whole movement. And then he starts to blame, you know, the reason why God allowed 9-11 to happen is because our country was taken over by those college teachers that I had. Um, and that's a huge polarizing moment. But his son is notoriously corrupt. He, he, um, he was in real estate, he's very rich. He would have these parties <laughs> with really questionable, it says, leave your religion at the door. And they had a lot of drinking and sexing and all this stuff. And also he helped all of his friends get super rich by writing contracts for all the buildings on the Liberty University campus, which the campus is full of huge buildings. So he's just helping his friends, you know? And then Billy Graham also had this huge empire that he built based on religion. And his son is corrupt. He's really into power. And he also was on the board of Liberty University. So that's, that is always a problem, is that how do you acknowledge people are better at different things and yet, and not allow money and power to get entrenched? Because then children will inherit privilege that they don't deserve, they didn't earn it, and they will not handle it well. And the society will just get more and more divided by class and privilege and more and more polarized. Because once the rich figure out that they're in an unjust situation, they can definitely hire people to, to speak rhetoric, either political rhetoric or capitalist rhetoric, to convince people that they're actually acting in their interest and also to polarize, to find somebody to blame, like Socrates, right? Some sort of intellectual who wants you to question, rethink, try to expose the corruption. Well, that person's going to get demonized. So the caste system had an originally decent idea, but it got corrupted. Um, 
All right. So the claim in Hinduism is that what you really want, what everybody really wants, is infinite being, infinite knowledge, and infinite power. And what the Hindus tell you is you already have it. It's actually right inside of you. You just have to turn inward. Um, you have to know yourself and you have to release all this crap inside of you and be liberated to stay in touch with the universe, um, to develop this God's eye point of view, um, to keep everything in perspective um, and to have peace of mind, right? So that's, that's what everybody really wants. But how do you get it, right? Um, you go through, there's these path of desire, path of success, path of duty, and then you go, you decide, okay, is that all there is? And you go in, inside. Now, there's also, the, there's two main paths in terms of the path of the heart and the path of the head. But each one of those involves meditation and action and reflection. So uh, a full life includes incorporating these different paths and then that emphasizes the different paths and different phases and stages of life. Um, so it's all a very caref carefully worked out system. So the wisdom tradition's goal is to unite our basic drives with culture, figure out how to create an integrated culture, that culture that integrates culture and nature and also promotes integrity in the souls of citizens and in their relations to each other. So, all right. Um, how many of you have had a conversion experience? So when we, start, when we have class, I'll ask you that, talk about conversion. Um, and the Bhagavad Gita is also the story of a conversion experience. And I might have time during class to talk about that, but it might be the second class where I talk about it. Then, um, the next thing is that we know a lot about the brain, but we don't necessarily know about the spirit. And the readings in Tippett were also about that, that Mr. Newland had studied the brain. I mean, he's a surgeon and the body, but he had not. It took him his own religious experience to understand what he's doing in a spiritual way that the human spirit wants seeks beauty, seeks integrity, and you just have these blockages in your physical health, but you have blockages in your spiritual, in your obsessive thinking also. Um, all right, so there's meditation techniques have been shown to work. The Benedictine tradition has a lot of the same techniques. I live with Benedictine nuns. I've done it 10 different summers. Um, okay. All right. There are medical doctors who practice meditation. All right. The next point is what is stress? And I want, we're going to have a conversation about that. So please talk about this. Is it, do you think it's a serious social problem? Does it impact our lives? Why do we experience it? Um, is the cause the responsibilities we have, is it the threat of, the, of survival that's causing it? Or is it basically all in our heads? It's the way our society is structured that ends up driving people crazy. Is stress natural or cultural? Do any of you worry about dying uh, an early death? Well, until COVID, I guess not, but um, maybe during COVID, some of you were really brought to the brink or you knew people who died. So that's another source of stress. But there's the other socially constructed stress, stress about doing well in school. How, how well is well enough? Um, how do you, does, if you, if your focus is your GPA and you can't, for some reason, you can't get straight A's, 
um, is that, right, that's going to cause stress. If your focus is on, well, I'm going to do my best. And if I get a B, it just means I shouldn't go into this professionally. That's part of why you get A's, B's, and C's is partly to know, first of all, how much effort you have to put into um, a, a professional career. It does involve a lot of work over a long period of time, and it never really lets up. And then second of all, what is it you're interested in, what you're passionate about, and what you can do that can, sort of comes easily to you. Um, all right, in your relationships, are you concerned about your public image or the quality of the relationship? So if a society only rewards people for external measurable outcomes, assessments, achievements, you can't always control that. As a matter of fact, in a lot of ways you can't control it. So if you, you're socially constructed to have your identity determined by external circumstances you can't control, that would cause a lot of stress, okay? Um, so then you ask, is a society um, designed to set people up for stress or is it just providing opportunities or how do you understand that? Um, let's see. And so I, I do think you should reflect on that a little bit. And I will ask you in class, do you think stress is natural or cultural or partly both? And which parts do you think are natural and which are cultural? I mean, you can use yourself as an example for right now, I'm stressed out about X, Y, Z. Um, is that just, there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to do all this stuff or is your attitude, is the stress really in your attitude or is the stress in your schedule, <laughs> right? And those are open questions and they vary a lot. So what do you really want in life? And how does Alliant Education fit with that? Um, here's the path of pleasure. And I guess maybe I will talk to you about tantric sex. Uh, I don't think I'll do it on the video. <laughs> um, but if we have time. Um, well, I, I guess I'll just say that they have a whole technique. They have books. And, you know, they teach you how to maximize your sexual pleasure while you're having sex. Because if you're on the path of pleasure, um, that's what you care about. And it's important that you go through with it because it's not violent sex. Violent sex is not very pleasant for anybody, but it's definitely not the level of pleasure you can get if you very carefully go through step by step, then you can have, you know, orgasms that last for a long time as, you know, they want to extend that pleasure, that sexual pleasure. And that's not going to be violent at all. It's not going to be aggressive. It's going to be very slow and deliberate and very pleasant. Uh, I don't know, you know, I've never been through, it, but it makes sense that if you're on the path of pleasure, you just, if you think about maximizing pleasure, you're gonna end up not being a very violent or aggressive person um, because in order to get pleasure, you have to slow down <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, the path of success is if that's your path, let's go for it. Um, but eventually you decide that is that all there is, you know? We can, we can see more broadly than that. And so after that, there's a drive for meaning and purpose. Um, and then after that's the path of duty. And then sometimes someone will say, is that all there is? It's just like, I can give money away, but you know, it's fine. Somebody else could also take my money and somebody else 
is closer to the boots on the ground, probably know better what to do with it. So I can give my money to these organizations and I can let go because I, I know as much as I can know about how to give money away thoughtfully. And so I'll leave it in somebody else's hands and I'm going to turn toward the Atman Brahma, getting in touch with myself. And so this would be, this is the mysticism, right? All the exercises are devoted to this practical aim. And there's four paths, the path of knowledge, the path of the heart, the path of, um, there are many in, incarnations of the Atman, including Krishna, Jesus Christ, Buddha, and Muhammad, uh, the path of work and psychological exercises, the four stages of life, the four stations of life, and the soul's coming of age in the universe. So that's it. Um, that was probably a longer video than usual, but I will see you on Monday. And I will, I have two papers I haven't read yet as of yesterday. And I will read those. I will read things today. Thank you.